from around the globe, it's theCUBE, presenting Adaptive Data Governance. Brought to you by IO Tahoe. Our next segment here is an interesting panel. You're going to hear from three gentlemen about adaptive data governance. We're going to talk a lot about that. Please welcome Yusuf Khan, the Global Director of Data Services for IO Tahoe. We also have Santiago Castro, the Chief Data Officer at the First Bank of Nigeria, and Gudron Vanderwall, Oracle's Senior Manager of Digital Transformation and Industries. Gentlemen, it's great to have you joining us in this in this panel. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, Santiago, we're going to start with you. Can you talk to the audience a little bit about the First Bank of Nigeria and its scale? This is beyond Nigeria. Talk to us about that. Yes, um, so First Bank of Nigeria was created 125 years ago. So one of the oldest, if not the oldest bank in Africa. And uh, because of the history, it, it grew uh, everywhere in the region and, and, and beyond the region. I, I am currently based in London where uh, it's kind of the European headquarters and it really promotes um, trade finance, institutional banking, corporate banking, private banking, uh, ar ar around uh, the world, in particular in relationship to Africa. We are also in Asia, in in uh, Middle East, uh, and and um, and yes, and it's a, a very kind of uh, active uh, bank in, in all these regions. So Santiago, talk to me about what adaptive data governance means to you, and how does it help the First Bank of Nigeria to be able to innovate faster with the data that you have? Yes, I like that concept of uh, adapt adaptive uh, data governance because it's kind of, a, a, I would say, an approach that can really happen today with the new technologies. Before, it was much more difficult to implement. So just to give you a little bit of context, I, I used to work in consulting for 16, 17 years before uh, joining the First Bank of Nigeria. And I saw many organizations trying to apply different type of uh, approaches in data governance. Uh, and, and the beginning, early days, was really kind of a hierarchical way, a top-down approach, where data governance was seen as uh, implement a set of rules, policies, and procedures, but really from the top down. And it's important. It's important to have the back of, of your C-level, of your, of your director. But whatever I saw, it just that way it fails. You really need to have a complementary approach. I often say uh, bottom up. And, and actually, as a CDO, I'm really trying to decentralize data governance to really, instead of imposing uh, a framework that some people in the business don't understand or don't care about it, uh, it really needs to come from them. So what I'm trying to say is that data basically support business objectives. And what you need to do is every business area needs information in order to take better decisions to actually be able to be more efficient or to create value, etc. Now, depending on the business questions they have to solve, they will need certain data sets. So they need actually to be able to uh, uh, have data quality for their own purpose. Now, when they understand that, they become the stewards naturally of their own data sets. And that is where my bottom line is, is meeting my top down. You can guide them from the top, but they need themselves to be also empowered and be actually in a way flexible to adapt uh, uh, the different uh, questions that they have in order to uh, be able to respond to the business needs. Uh, and, and I think that is where uh, this adaptive data governance uh, uh, starts, because if you, if you want, I'll, I'll give you an example. In the bank we work, imagine a Venn diagram, right? So we have information that is provided to finance, and other information to risk, and other information to business development. And in this Venn diagram, there is going to be parts of that, every circle that are going to kind of intersect with each other, right? So what you want as a data governance is to help providing what is in common and then let them do their own analysis to what is really related to their own area. As an example, nationality. You would say in a bank that when you open an account is the nationality of your customer. That's fine for finance when they want to do a balance sheet, an accounting, or a P&L. But for risk, they want that type of analysis plus uh, the nationality of exposure, meaning where you are actually exposed as a risk. So you can have a customer that on board in the UK, but then trade with Africa and in Africa they're exposing their credit. So what I'm trying to say is they have piece, pieces in common and pieces that are different. Now, I cannot impose a definition for everyone. I need them to adapt and to bring their answers 
to their own business question. That is adaptive data governance. And all that is possible because we have, and I was saying at the very beginning, just to finalize the point, uh, we have new technologies that allow you to do this metadata classification uh, in a very sophisticated way that you can actually create uh, analytics of your metadata. You can understand your different data sources in order to be able to create those classifications, like nationality is a way of classifying your customers, your products, etc. But you will need to understand which areas need with what type of uh, nationality or classification, which others will need that all the time. And the more you create that uh, understanding, that uh, uh, intelligence about how your people are using your uh, data, you create in a way big building blocks, like a Lego, if you want, where you provide them with uh, those definitions, those catalogs, you understand how they are used, but you let them compose like Lego. They would play their way to build their analysis and they will be adaptive. And, and I think the new technologies are allowing that. And this is a real game changer, I would say, in data governance. So one of the things that you just said, Santiago, kind of struck me, to enable the users to be adaptive, they probably don't want to be logging in support tickets. So how do you support that sort of self-service to meet the demand of the user so that they can be adaptive? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And that goes along with uh, that type of uh, approach I was saying where uh, in a way, more and more business users want autonomy and they want to basically be able to grab the data and answer their own question. And when you have that, that's great because then you have demand. The business is asking for uh, data. They are asking for uh, uh, the, the insights. Uh, so how do you actually uh, support that? I would say there is a, a change in culture that is happening. Uh, more and more. I would say even the current pandemic has helped a lot into that because you have had, uh, in a way, of course, technology is one of the biggest winners. Without technology, we couldn't have been working remotely. Without these technologies where people can actually log in from their homes and still have a market data marketplace where they self-serve their, their information. But even beyond that, data is a big winner. Uh, data because uh, the pandemic has shown us that uh, crisis happen, that we cannot predict everything, and that we are actually facing a new kind of situation out of our comfort zone where we need to explore and we need to adapt and we need to be flexible. How do we do that with data? Uh, as a good example is every, every country, every government is publishing every day the stats of what's happening in their countries with the COVID and the pandemic so they can understand how to react because this is new. So you need facts in order to learn and adapt. Now, the, the, the companies are the same. Uh, every single company either saw the revenue going down or the revenue going very up for those companies that are very digital already. Now, it changed the reality. So they needed to adapt, but for that, they needed information in order to think and innovate and try to uh, create responses. So that type of uh, uh, self-service of data, hunger for data in order to be able to understand what's happening when the context is changing is something that is becoming more uh, 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 of the topic today because uh, of the pandemic, because of the new capabilities, the technologies that allow that. And then uh, you then are allowed to basically help your, your, your uh, data citizens, I call them in, in the organization, people that know their business and can actually start playing and, and answer their own questions. Uh, so, so these technologies that gives more accessibility to the data, that gives uh, some cataloging so they can understand where to go and what to find, that gives uh, lineage and relationships. All this is, is basically the new type of uh, uh, platforms and tools that allow you to create what I call uh, a data uh, marketplace. So once you create that marketplace, they can play with it. And I was talking about new culture, and I'm going to finish with that uh, uh, idea. Uh, I think these new tools are really strong because they are now allowing for people that are not technology or IT people to be able to play with data because it comes in uh, uh, the, the, the digital world they are used to. I'll give you an example. With IoTaho, you have a very interesting search functionality where if you want to find your data and you want to sell serve, you go there in that search and you actually go and, and look for your data. Everybody knows how to search in Google. Everybody's searching the internet. So this is part of the data culture, the, the digital culture. They know how to use those tools. Now, similarly, that data marketplace 
is uh, in, in, in IoTaho, you can, for example, see uh, which data sources are mostly used. So when I'm doing an analysis, I see that colleagues in my area are also using these sources, so I trust those sources. It's a little bit like Amazon. When uh, you buy that, it suggests you what next to buy. Again, this is the digital kind of culture where people very easily will understand. Similarly, you can actually like some uh, type of uh, data sets that are working. That's Facebook. So what I'm trying to say is you have some very easy user-friendly technologies that allows you to understand how interact with them. And then within the type of uh, uh, digital uh, uh, knowledge that you have, be able to self-serve, play, collaborate with your own peers, collaborate with the data, create your analysis. So it's really enabling uh, very easily that, that transition to, to become a data savvy without actually needing uh, too much knowledge of IT or coding, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that is, a game changer as well. And enabling that speed that we're all demanding today during these unprecedented times. Gudrun, I wanted to go to you as we talk about in the spirit of evolution, technology is changing. Talk to us a little bit about Oracle Digital. What are you guys doing there? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, Oracle Digital is a business unit at Oracle EMEA, and we focus on emerging countries as well as low end enterprises in the mid market in more developed countries. And four years ago, this started with the idea to engage digital with our customers via central hubs across EMEA. That means engaging with video, having conference calls, having a wall, a green wall where we stand in front and engage with our customers. No one at that time could have foreseen how this is the situation today. And this helps us to engage with our customers in the way where we're already doing. And then about my team. The focus of my team is to have early stage conversations with our, with our customers on digital transformation and innovation. And we also have a team of industry experts who engage with our customers and share expertise across EMEA. And we, we inspire our customers. The outcome of these conversations for Oracle is a deep understanding of our customer needs, which is very important. So we can help the customer. And for the customer means that we will help them with our technology and our resources to achieve their goals. It's all about outcomes, right, Gudran? So in terms of automation, what are some of the things Oracle is doing there to help your clients leverage automation to improve agility so that they can innovate faster, which in these interesting times, it's demanding? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, well, traditionally, Oracle is known for their databases, which have been innovated year over year, since the first launch. Um, and the latest innovation is the autonomous database and the autonomous data warehouse. For our customers, this means a reduction in operational cost by 90% with a multimodal converged database and machine learning based automation for full lifecycle management. Our database is self-driving. This means we automate database provisioning, tuning and scaling. The database is self-securing. This means automate data protection and security and it's self-repairing the automate failure detection, failover and repair. And then the question is for our customers, what does it mean? It means they can focus on their, on their business instead of uh, maintaining their infrastructure and their operations. That's absolutely critical. Yusuf, I wanna go over to you now. Some of the things that we've talked about, just the, the massive progression in technology, the evolution of that, but we know that whether we're talking about data management or digital transformation. A one size fits all approach doesn't work to address the challenges that the business has, um, that the IT folks have. As you are looking through the industry with what Santiago told us about First mm. uh, Bank of Nigeria, what are some of the changes that you're seeing that IOTAHO is seeing throughout the industry? Uh, well, Lisa, I think uh, the, the first way I'd characterize it is to say the traditional kind of top-down approach to data where you have almost a, a data policeman uh, who tells you what you can and can't do just doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's too slow. It's too resource intensive. Uh, data management, data governance, digital transformation itself, it has to be collaborative uh, and there has to be an element of personalization to data users. Um, in the environment we find ourselves in now, it has to be about enabling self-service as well. Um, a a one-size-fits-all model when it comes to those things around data doesn't work. As, as Santiago was saying, it, it needs to be adapted to how the data is used and, and who is using it. 
Uh, and in order to do this, companies, enterprises, organizations really need to know their data. They need to understand uh, what data they hold, where it is, and what the sensitivity of it is. They can then, in a more agile way, apply appropriate controls uh, and access so that people themselves are, and groups within businesses are agile and can innovate. Otherwise, everything grinds to a halt and, and you risk uh, falling behind your competitors. Yeah, that one-size-fits-all term just doesn't apply when you're talking about adaptive mm -hmm. and agility. So we, we heard from Santiago about some of the impact that they're making with First Bank of Nigeria. You said, talk to us about some of the business outcomes that you're seeing other customers make leveraging automation that they could not do before. Uh, I guess uh, one of the key ones is around um, just it, it's, it, it's automatically being able to classify teradytes, terabytes of data, or even petabytes of data across different sources to find duplicates, uh, which you can then remediate and delete. Now, with the capabilities that IOTAHO offers uh, and that Oracle offers, you can do things not just with a five times or a 10 times improvement, uh, but it actually enables you to do projects full stop that otherwise would fail or you would just not be able to do. I mean, uh, classifying multi-terabyte and multi-petabyte estates across different sources, formats, very large volumes of data. In many scenarios, you just can't do that manually. Um, I mean, we've worked with uh, government departments uh, and the issues there, as you'd expect, are there is a lot of fragmented data, there's a lot of different sources, there's a lot of different formats. And without these newer technologies to address it with automation uh, and machine learning, uh, the project isn't doable, but now it is. Uh, and that, that could lead to a revolution in, in some of these businesses and organizations. To enable that revolution, now, there's got to be the right cultural mindset and one of the, when Santiago was talking mm. about folks really kind of adapting to that, and the thing I always call that getting comfortably uncomfortable, but that's mm. hard for organizations to do. The technology is here to enable that. But when you're talking with, with customers, Yusuf, how do you help them build the trust and the confidence that the new technologies mm. and the new approaches can deliver what they need? How do you help drive the kind of the tech and the culture? It's, it's a really good question, Lisa, because it, it, it can be quite scary. Um, I think the first thing we'd start with is to say, look, the technology is here uh, with businesses like IOTAHO and like Oracle. It's already arrived. Uh, what you need to be comfortable doing is experimenting, being agile around it, um, and trying new ways of doing things uh, if you don't want to get left behind. And, and Santiago uh, and the team at FBN are, are a great example of embracing it testing it on a small scale, uh, and then scaling up. Um, at IOTAHO, we, we offer what we call a data health check, which can actually be done very quickly in a, in a matter of a few weeks. So we'll work with a customer, uh, pick a use case, install the application, uh, analyze the data, drive out some, some quick wins. So we worked uh, in the last few weeks with a large energy, energy supplier. And in about 20 days, we were able to give them an accurate understanding of their critical data elements, Apply, help them apply data protection policies, minimize copies of the data, uh, and work out what data they needed to delete to reduce their infrastructure spend. Um, so it's about experimenting on that small scale, being agile, uh, and then scaling up in, 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 a, in a kind of very modern way. Great advice. Uh, Santiago, I'd like to go back to you as we kind of look at, again, that, that topic of culture and the need to get that mindset there to facilitate these rapid changes. I want to understand kind of last question for you about how you're doing that from a digital transformation perspective. We know everything is accelerating in 2020. So how are you building resilience into your data architecture and also driving that cultural change that can help everyone in this shift to remote working and a lot of the, the digital challenges and changes that we're all going through? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting transition, I would say. Um, I, would, I was mentioning, just coming back to some of the points before uh, to, to transition with these, I, I said that uh, the new technologies allowed us to discover the data in a new way, to plug and see very quickly information, to have new models of govern the data. Uh, we were talking about uh, data type governance and giving autonomy to our uh, different uh, data units. Well, 
from that autonomy, they can then compose and innovate their own ways. So for me, now we're talking about resilience because in a way, autonomy and flexibility in an organization, in a data structure with Platform gives you resilience. The organizations and the business units that I have experienced in the pandemic uh, uh, are working well, are those that actually, because they are not physically present anymore in the office, you need to give them their autonomy and let them actually engage on their own side and do their own job and trust them in a way. And as you give them that, they start innovating and they start having a really interesting uh, idea. So autonomy and flexibility, I think, is, 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 is a key component of the new infrastructure, but even the new reality. The uh, uh, pandemic showed us that, yes, we used to be very kind of uh, uh, structured policies, procedures, that's very important, but now we learn flexibility and adaptability at the same uh, side. Now, when you have that, uh, a key other uh, component of resilience is speed. Of course, uh, uh, people want you know to access the data and access it fast and, and decide fast, especially if changes are changing so quickly now that, that you need to be able to, to you know interact and iterate with your information to answer your questions quickly. And coming back maybe to uh, where uh, Joseph was saying, I completely agree, is about experimenting and iterating. You will not get it right the first time, especially that the world is changing too fast and we don't have answers uh, already set for everything. So we need to just go play and have ideas, fail, fail fast, and then learn and then go for the next. So technology that allows you to uh, be flexible, iterate, and in a very fast, agile way, uh, continue uh, will allow you to uh, actually be resilient in that way because you are flexible, you adapt, you are agile, and you continue answering questions as they come without having uh, everything set in a structure that is too uh, hard. Now, coming back to your idea about the culture, uh, is changing in employees and in customers, right? Uh, our employees, our customers are more and more digital savvies. And uh, in a way, the pandemic has accelerated that. We had uh, many branches of the bank that people uh, used to go to ask for things. Now they cannot go. You need to, I mean, here in Europe with the lockdown, you physically cannot be going to the branches and, and many shops that have been closed. So they had to use our mobile apps and they have to go into the internet banking, which is great because that was the acceleration we wanted. Similarly, our employees needed to work uh, remotely, so they needed to engage with the digital platform. Now, what that means, and this is, uh, I think, the really strong point of the cultural change for resilience, is that more and more we have two types of connectivity that is happening with data. Uh, and I call it employees connecting to data, the cell service we're talking about, uh, employees connecting with each other, the collaboration that uh, 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 Joseph was uh, 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 talking about, uh, which is allowing people to share ideas, learn and innovate, because the more you have platforms where people can actually uh, uh, find themselves uh, and play with the data, they can uh, 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 bring new ideas to their analysis. And then employees actually connecting to algorithms. And this is the other part that is really interesting. We also are a partner of uh, uh, Oracle, and Oracle in that is, is great. They have embedded within their transactional system uh, many algorithms that are allowing us to calculate as the transactions happen. What happened there is that when our customers engage with algorithms, and again with Ayotaho as well, the, the machine learning that is there for, for speeding the automation of how you find your data, allows you to create uh, uh, an alliance with the machine. The machine is there to actually, in a way, be your best friend, to actually have more volume of data calculated faster, in a way right. that you can discover uh, more variety. I mean, we couldn't cope without being connected to these algorithms. And that will finally get to the last connection I was saying, is the customers themselves engaging with the, connecting with the data. Uh, I was saying they are more and more engaging with our uh, app and our website and, and, and they're digitally savvy. Uh, the expectations of the customer has changing. I work in a bank where the industry is completely challenged. You used to have uh, people going to a branch, as I was saying, uh, 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 they cannot not only not go there, but they are even going from branch to digital to apps to now even wanting to have uh, 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 business services actually in every single uh, 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 app that they are using. So the data becomes a service for them. 
the data they want to see how they spend their money and, and the data of their transactions will tell them what is actually their spending tool is going well with their lifestyle style. For example, we talk about, I don't know, I'm a healthy person. I want to see that I'm spending in the good food and the right kind of healthy environment, whereas if I'm right, more environmentally right. engaged. Now, all this is metadata, is knowing how to classify your data according to my values, my lifestyle, is algorithms, I'm coming back to my three uh, connections, is the algorithms that allow me to very quickly uh, analyze that metadata and actually my uh, staff in the background creating those understanding of the customer journey to give them uh, that, that service that they expect on a digital channel, which is actually allowing them to understand how they uh, are, are engaging with financial services. And, and, and that's all that engagement is absolutely critical. Uh, Santiago, thank you for, for sharing that. I do want to wrap really quickly, Gujon, one last question for you. Santiago talked about Oracle. You've talked about it a little bit. As we look at digital resilience, talk to us a little bit in the last minute about the evolution of Oracle, what you guys are doing there to help your customers get the resilience that they have to have to be, to not just survive, but thrive. Yeah. Well, Oracle has a cloud offering for infrastructure, database, platform service, and the complete solutions offered as SaaS. Um, and as, as Santiago also mentioned, we are using AI across our entire portfolio. And by this, we help our customers to focus on their business innovation and capitalize on data by enabling new business models. Um, and Oracle has a global coverage with their cloud regions. It's massively investing in innovating and expanding their cloud. And by offering cloud as public cloud in our data centers and also as private cloud with clouded customer, we can meet every sovereignty and security requirement. And in this way, we help people to see data in new ways. We discover insights and unlock endless possibilities. And, and maybe one, one of my takeaways is, if I, if I speak with customers, I always tell them, you better start collecting your data now. We enable this. Partners like IOTA help us as well. If you collect your data now, you are ready for tomorrow. You can never collect your data backwards. So that is my takeaway for today. You can't collect your data backwards. Excellent, Gujan. Gentlemen, thank you for sharing all of your insights. Very informative conversation. All right, this is theCUBE, the leader in live digital tech coverage.